Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wadcast Podcast. I'm your host, Eddie Ift, and I am here live from the Bingle Bus. That's right. I'm sitting on a bus right now. This is a nice, uh, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, is, that, is that a better angle? Do you guys like that? Yes. I'm uh, telling you this if you're listening to the podcast. Most everybody listens to the podcast, but it is available on uh, on YouTube. If you want to watch them, we're trying to get our YouTube views up. Can't do it for some reason. Maybe I'm not, uh, you know, maybe you just don't want to look at me. I don't, I don't blame you. Look at this. Uh, or maybe I just, it's just not action packed enough for a video for you to watch. Or maybe you're just the kind of people that you drive in your car and you listen to the show when you're driving. Look, I appreciate you no matter what. I just figured that uh, weirdo CrossFitters love, uh, love YouTube. And, uh, so you'd be on YouTube and watching. I post some little clips and stuff there. Jeremy Lesniak helps me out with that. Uh, we got uh, all kinds of cool stuff going on. Um, you guys, uh, I love the feedback. I love when you give me information. More than anything, I love when you review the show on iTunes because it gets us higher. Uh, you, know, you know how you hear about algorithms all the time and people talk about algorithms, algorithms. It's one of those buzzwords like pivot or walk that back or uh, all the... You know the lingo that people use now? It's all like corporate speak. Uh, I'm gonna walk. We're gonna walk. We're gonna unpack that. We're gonna unpack that. Then he's gonna walk it back, and he pivoted after that. Um, well, um, I hate the one algorithm. Everybody talks about the algorithm that the computer uses is to define how you figure it out if you're a human being. Uh, the algorithm that Apple uses, for some reason, to get high in the rankings, it also involves comments and reviews. So I ask that if you follow the show, if you listen to it every week, if you appreciate the show, if you've never donated, the very least, just please leave a review. Just go five stars and be like, Eddie's got a huge dong, or something like that. I don't even care what you say, just as long as it's uh, somewhat complimentary I mean, because I think they like, I don't know if they read the reviews, but as long as you do five star, uh, just be like, great show, five star, um, then it helps us. Then more people find out about the show. I have reached out to you guys to find out how you found out about the show. Very few people came here from talking shit. Most people Googled CrossFit podcast and found this. I am sorry that I don't always talk about CrossFit. I use CrossFit to do other things. I do not CrossFit to CrossFit. I know a lot of you do, and I, I don't blame you for that. Uh, if you, if I lived in a lot of these places in the country where I go to visit often, it's all I do. When I'm in the middle of Arkansas or Ohio or something, and it's fucking freezing out and there's nothing to do, I go and hang out at the gym all day long because it is fun. It's enjoyable. So I understand that. I understand that. Uh, I am very fortunate to live in California and pay super high taxes, which everybody gives me shit for. Um, I, I don't know why people outside of California hate the taxes more than the people in California. But uh, yeah, so um, so I've decided to live here. I enjoy it. I like the ocean. I like the mountains. And um, here's the deal. Um, I'm here. Uh, I do this show every single week. We talk about fitness, health, um, because it should be everybody's A number one priority. It is with me. I'm a healthy individual, but I also care about other people. And I'm not joking when I say that because I come off as a cynical prick. But the truth is I really do care. Uh, I like people as a group. Uh, people used to say uh, I like individuals. I don't like groups. I like groups. I don't like individuals. So as a like the human race, I'd like to see everybody get a lot healthier. You get healthier, my health insurance uh, costs go down. Uh, you get healthier, I just don't have to, you don't get in my way. You know, it's irritating when I'm in Target and you're in your Razor scooter. Now, I don't know, I'm just pontificating right now. I hate that word too, that's another weird word, pontificate. It sounds like a kind of boat that, you know, you party on. I'm on my pontificating boat, that's... No, that's a pontoon boat. Uh, anyway, I'm rambling. I do that a lot. 
Uh, today, I don't ramble. I have a great, great, great interview with an OG of CrossFit, an OG of the Wadcast, one of our favorite guests of all time. I just saw him on Instagram and I was like, dude, I need to talk to you because he's so fun to talk to. And this show got, uh, we didn't talk very much about, uh, I'm talking about the man, the myth, the legend, John Wellborn, who is, uh, you know, goes way back in CrossFit. He started CrossFit football. Uh, then it turned into Power Athlete HQ, which is what he has now. One of the authorities when it comes to strength and power, especially in this realm of, uh, of, of strength and conditioning. Just an expert, just such a knowledgeable, smart guy. Graduated from Berkeley, went on to play for the Eagles and a couple other NFL teams. Uh, awesome dude. Just an awesome dude. And he kind of picked my brain and we talked about comedy a lot. Uh and uh, just thought, um, I, I hope it's interesting. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I hope it makes you laugh sometimes. I try it every once in a while to make you laugh. Uh, I wish I did it more often. We're going to have an offshoot of this show. We're, uh, we're going to do a once a month for all the Patreon givers. You give to Patreon, we're going to give you an extra episode every month on Patreon. You're going to have to get the episode through Patreon. And that's going to be anybody who gives a $5 or more. You also get yourself in a drawing to win... A myopox and a leopard claw. This is like $450 worth of shit. You're going to give $5 and you might get one. Okay. Uh, this week's winner. We've got a winner. We are the champions, my friends. And we stick together till the end. Um, here it is. Our winner this week, I had him marked. Um, where'd you go, dude? Gabriel. Gabriel. <laughs> I don't even have a last name for you. I have an email address for you, Gabriel. Just know, Gabriel, that you're going to get an email. If your name is Gabriel and you gave $5 to Patreon, pretty good chance it's you. Um, but you won yourself a Maya Pucks and a Leopard Claw. Uh, we'll send you an email. Troy will get one of these or both of these out to you. ASAP Troy from over there at My Pucks, uh, which makes the uh, they are the um, I should open this up for you guys to see. Um, da, 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 da. There's so much cool shit in here. Basically, this is what runs it. OK, this little thing looks like an iPhone, right? You turn it on. Uh, I don't have a charge, so it's not going to turn on. Maybe it will. Who knows? Yeah. There, turned on, okay? Let me see. There. And you basically set, do you want mixed recovery, recovery, conditioning, strengthening? You put a pad like this. That's a good back pad. That like sticky thing goes on your back. Or these can go on anywhere else on your body, okay? And then they can plug in there. Or these are the ones I use most of the time right here. I use these, these ones. Um these little ones I put on whatever muscle I want going. You're like, what's that? Uh, this is the electrode pads. Now this is what plugs into it. There's a lot of stuff here, it looks like, but it's so simple. You basically put this onto this. So it snaps in. Boom. That. Stick it right on your muscle, like wherever you want it. Good, bop, bop, bop. And then that uh, little iPad thing or I iPhone thing. Sends a signal, sends a signal to it, did, 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 and it just starts to pulsate and makes your blood flow to that body part. That way you don't damage the tissue that's already been damaged and you get blood there and all the bad blood goes out to your lymphatic system and you heal quicker. Um, just had uh, my friend put one of these on and he's using it right now. I hurt his back. Um, I use it constantly and then this is called a leopard claw this is a little case it comes in look at how beautiful this thing is. all these military guys use these um they take them because think about it do you ever play paintball and after you're done with paintball you're like oh my god i'm in so much pain imagine what military guys are like when real bullets are flying well these guys have to keep themselves uninjured so uh uh leopard claw does a project with them the resiliency project and they send these to them but you're like, what is this? Is this a boomerang? Is this uh, is this a dildo? Is this uh, is this a sushi knife? What is this thing? 
I'll tell you what it is. It's a it's a nose picker for elephants. That's what. No, it's a it's a leopard claw, and you use it. Here's a good place, like right here. But you you can put some like lube on there, and then what you do, you locate any kind of like any kind of like place in your muscle where there's a adhesions and you kind of just scrape them out and you're going why would you do that because those adhesions prevent blood flow and blood flow is what you need if you ever got a boner you'd know you need blood flow in there right well i'm not telling you to do this to your boner but uh you should do it uh to your any body parts where you feel like you're gooked up and your muscles aren't working correctly and there's some pain there, maybe some inflammation, maybe some tendonitis. Get in there with a leopard claw. So like I said, Gabriel, con congratulations on winning it and thank you to everybody that supported on our Patreon. And like I said, we're going to be doing an extra episode every month. Those episodes are going to be more like this episode with John Wellborn. They'll be like the 30, 40, 50 episode. The rest of them I will try to adhere to a more of a CrossFit fitness podcast those will go more down the funny road uh back to maybe the days of talking shit uh god i miss that show so much so um what else is going on uh, my touring is starting next month december i'm going to start posting my dates uh it's so weird because i don't want to post them because then they get canceled and people get mad that you're performing and if it's an indoor venue you know it's like are you an anti-masker no I'm a masker. I wear a mask whenever I have to. I constantly try to keep myself safe, keep other people safe around me. And uh, I do believe in, in that masks work. And uh, I don't want to infect other people. I don't think I have it, but I never know if I'm asymptomatic, so I don't take any chances. Uh, I don't want to argue with you or fight with you about this. You have your beliefs. I have my beliefs. Um, but I am doing gigs because I'm also at the place where – I have a family to take care of and I need an income. So I will be performing in North Carolina. I got Minneapolis coming up, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, Alaska just got, we got put on like hiatus. I, I don't know what's happening, but let's hope this, you know, shit ends soon and uh, we can all get back to normal. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Um, it's a year anniversary of when we ran our 68 mile run. I need something else. I'm uh, talking to a bunch of guys about doing the Ironman this year. That is probably going to happen. Uh, otherwise, CrossFit competitions. I want to come to Wadapalooza. I want to perform at Wadapalooza. So I'm going to talk to Matt O'Keefe about that. I think that is uh, uh, a good thing that I should probably put on the calendar. I will do a show at Wadapalooza. And uh, I think that'd be really fun to have a whole bunch of CrossFitters there and make fun of everybody. Uh, what else? What else? What else? I think that's it, guys. I, I There's not much more to talk about. Um, clean up your gyms. Clean up your gyms. I'm so proud of all the gyms that are staying open. I know how hard it is. Uh, I'm sorry for the ones that aren't open. Uh, just check out Purify. This guy, Johnny Beal, is doing a really good job. Uh, he's doing a really good job at, like, they've specialized in keeping gyms clean. Go to their website, purify.com. And they have uh, all this information on what you have to do to keep your place virus clean. Because at the end of the day, yeah, we all know it's the breathing, but there is some touching going on. So if you can get your gym clean, like people work with their own stuff. Like you have your own dumbbells, your own barbells, your own pull-up bar, whatever. But then the guy after you comes in. Well, maybe if you were asymptomatic or something and you had some virus on you, you're going to shed that. That shit can be cleaned very, very easily. Uh, I'm not doing a commercial right now for Purefly. What I'm doing is I'm trying to help you guys with your gyms. If you don't uh, own a gym, if you're just a member, tell your coaches, tell your owners, say, hey, guys, get this stuff so that we all can stay. Gyms are known to be <laughs> they're the healthiest places because people in gyms are healthy, but for some reason we can uh, transfer the virus there a lot. So... Uh, and, and then again, it's probably not affecting people that are in the gym because those people in the gym are probably pretty healthy people, but then they can infect other people that aren't so healthy. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's the point I'm trying to make. So I want you guys to stay open. Uh, I, I, I love the gyms that are staying open and figuring out a way around all this shit because, you know, we got to do it. 
uh, let me find out. There's a couple other things that I have to talk about today. And uh, why aren't they here? They should be in my phone right now. And they're not. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, oh, we have a couple of our sponsors I want to talk about. Gooder. Uh, Gooder, I wore their glasses yesterday for my mountain bike ride. They are the best glasses. Saved my life a couple times because not only did they keep the sun out of my eyes while I was going down these pretty gnarly trails, but I also got hit in the face with a bunch of sticks and could have put my eye out. And luckily, I had my polarized Gooder glasses on, which are rubberized so they don't slip off your face ever. They look cool as shit, too. And they're having a, uh, they're having a, uh, a Good Friday. A good Friday, a black Friday, good black, brown, whatever, black Friday. Um, it's uh, their deal is 70% off your order if you go to gooder.com slash wadcast. That's G O O D R dot com slash wadcast. How about that? And we also, another sponsor, uh, Inside Tracker, who I love. Inside Tracker, I got my blood work done. They told me everything about what I was sufficient in, what I wasn't sufficient in, what I need to work on, what I needed to do more of. Did I need to do more endurance work? Did I need to do more high-intensity interval training? Did I need to do less high-intensity interval training? Did I need to eat foods with more magnesium? What are the foods with more magnesium? This all came from uh, my couple things. I needed to kind of cut off the coconut oil and the butter. I was going a little too high on that. I needed to increase my protein. We all know that. Look at lanky arms over here. Um, and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So check out Inside Tracker. Uh, it's it's so important that you do this. Um, you can go to insidetracker.com. Oh, the, the code they're giving us is so difficult. You're going to have to go to our site for it. But um, here, I'm going to tell you what they say. November 25th to December 1st, take advantage of the Inside Tracker best deal of the year. Take control of your health and wellness with $200 off their ultimate plan, their most comprehensive package. You're going to use the code WADCAST30 at InsideTracker.com. That's WADCAST30, I think all caps, at InsideTracker.com. This is something you want to get. It's an ultra-personalized nutrition platform that analyzes your blood and DNA biomarkers along with your lifestyle habits to help you optimize your body and reach your goals. Like I said, 200 bucks off. Wadcast30 at InsideTracker.com. I think it's time to start the episode. What do you guys think? It was a, It's a long episode because we just... I could talk to Wellborn forever. I um, hope you guys... Have a really good Thanksgiving. Hope you got a chance to see your family. Hope you guys stay safe. And uh, please send me comments, anything at wadcastpodcast at yahoo.com or on my Instagram. I talked to a lot of you anyway. And uh, that's it. Enjoy. John Wellworn, how you doing? Good, man. I thought we were just going to get on talking shit, but I guess we're Wadcast Podcast. But Wadcast Podcast, like... Uh... It's, it's just it's, turned into talking shit. Kind of. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's evolved because because uh, I don't like to do CrossFit anymore. <laughs> I I literally, the workouts I do now are like three sets of 10. <laughs> uh, I think what happens is everybody gets back and realizes that they just want to bang some weights and be in good shape. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I, like that's not hard. I like to go surfing and not be in pain and yeah like you're like like all of a sudden your hands hit the salt water and you're like ah yeah yeah i'm burning yeah. i have no skin on my i i just i don't like old guys paddling past me all the time because i'm not i'm my shoulders are blown out from doing 100 handstand push-ups well as long as you got a social distance in the water right i mean you're still surfing in malibu aren't you yeah i had a dude talking to me today and he was right up on me i was like dude back off i don't want to breathe your covid I don't want uh, it. I uh, I want to find somebody that has it and lick them in the mouth. You want to get it? Yeah, I'd totally be up for it. I have hunters like that. Hunter McIntyre's like, I have yeah. flown 70 times and have not gotten it. I, I uh, like, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I, I think, uh, like, in all terms of, like, the the research of it, I think that they should quarantine old people. Yeah, that's... If you're, if you're, that, if you're over 70... Like, I think you should quarantine. I think if you have a ton of metabolic issues and you're overweight and you're stressed and 
you know, you have a lot of like autoimmune, a lot of problems going on, you should quarantine. I agree. Uh, if you're I, a healthy individual that goes outside and wants to go to the beach, uh, I think it's it's less likely of an issue. That's that's where I stand. I got in a fight with my family. They were talking about masks and everything. I said, I don't wear a mask for me. I wear a mask for you. I'm going to be fine. If I get it, <laughs> I'm fine. My dad's like 84. My yeah. mom's already on oxygen. And mm-hmm. they're like, you know, diehard Trumpers. And I'm like, look, it's I'm I'm wearing this so I don't kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know what uh, what is that like it's it's pretty interesting if you look at the demographics of people that are you know like uh i'm sure the research would show if if somebody were to do it that your seriousness for covid is probably directly related to where you were in the political leanings so weird it's so weird except for they said you know that's why they were thinking he was uh biden was going to flip florida was that elderly people are a little scared of covid but but not as many as you think. Some of them are like, hey, I've lived a long life. Yeah. I don't want to be shut in. And the last few years of my life are spent this way. I'd yeah. rather go live them, you know, and uh, but th- that's I agree with you. Um, I had a cardiologist friend I just talked to who's in Pittsburgh. I said, uh, what's the deal? And he, lo- he said, look, deaths are down 50 percent overall. Yeah. He said. Um, testing's up. So numbers are going to be up. He said, however, if I were you, I wouldn't come home and see your parents, <laughs> you know, yeah. like don't, don't get in the house with your parents. And, uh, and then I saw a guy on, uh, I don't know if it was on the CrossFit site or morning chalk up saying, uh, saying he was a doctor and he said, look, I don't, everybody I see in here has, has metabolic disease. Like they, if they're in here, there's something wrong with them. And sure. that's why they're in here. So. Well, it's um, it's like compounding stuff, like the people that have had issues, and uh, even uh, so, we live next door to a, a horse school, mm-hmm. and the girls ride and whatnot, and like it was pretty interesting. Like everybody gets tested, and uh, one of the girls who ended up testing positive is like thirteen, had zero symptoms, was fine. Mm-hmm. Her mom, who has like a few, you know, overweight and a few other issues, wiped on her ass. Yeah. And it's like for healthy individuals that train, eat well, sleep, and you know don't have any metabolic distress, and uh, you know are fairly healthy and don't have any pre-existing conditions, it it looks uh it's it's a different landscape. And so the one the problem thing the, becomes is when you paint everybody with the same brush. The one thing that scares me are the I think it's called ground glass opocytes or whatever that show up in your lungs mm-hmm. that they find that that can cause some scarring, and then you end up with something like pulmonary fibrosis later in life. That's that's my only fear is that somewhat. But I mean, my fear exists with the vaccine, too, and I'm not an anti-vaxxer by any means. But there's a reason most vaccinations take 10 years Mm -hmm. to uh, to go through testing where they're like 10 years later. They're like, oh, you know, we shouldn't have done this or now we can approve it. I just don't like that, you know, rushing that vaccine through. Um, What I'd like to see is better testing. I worked uh, a buddy of mine was doing concierge testing to like corporations. So he, he, he was saying to me like, Hey, bring me, bring me companies, just bring me any company, you know, and uh, I'll do testing for them and I can test everybody. And he was, he was doing, you know, casinos in Las Vegas, like all their employees, he was making millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, wait, you have access because you've cash like to do this. And I was, aren't you running out of the antigen? Aren't you running out of uh, swabs? And he's like, no, no. And I'm like, well, why is the government running out of them? <laughs> and, uh, is it the government? <laughs> exactly. Like, and oh, Jesus. I love our, our head of testing, Jared Kushner. Uh, yeah. what I well, would, you know what I, it, it, uh, before you get on him, man, that dude is, uh, is probably going to go when history looks back as being very, very successful, even though he does look like a, like, uh, you know, most punchable I, face uh, in the world. <laughs> Uh, I heard a rumor that he paid like double or triple the value for 666, um, uh, what was it, like a Central Park Place or something. He bought some some high rise for some exorbitant amount of money that was like double what it was asking because of the address was 666. So I'm like, you know, and, and then, the, of course, all the, uh, you know, he's a devil worshiper, Q non oh, you know, sacrificing children. Oh. And so I was like, I was like, maybe the guy just likes even numbers, Yeah, you know? Um, <laughs> but uh, like pretty interesting. Like I think when history looks back at that dude and, and I always love the, like um, 
as you know, uh, I don't really identify with anything because I think it's all bullshit. Same, same with you me. You know, and and I don't get polarized like like I hear this and like people are like, oh, and I'm like, okay, like yeah, let's look at this intelligently. All I know is our founding fathers would have already fucking strung everybody up. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, let's be a little intelligent on this. Like, I'm like, okay, so we're just voting for who you think you're better or like yeah. who you like more in terms of like old white men that uh, have never really worked a day in their life. I mean, Biden's been in for 47 years like has never run a business. I mean, Trump, you know, whether or not you say he can run a business or not, or a successful businessman, at least there was always an illusion that Trump would go back into private business. So he might not do shit that fucking grenades the, sure. the country. Sure. Whereas you have a guy like Biden who has never run a business, has never, you know, 47 years he's been in DC, which maybe like uh, from an outsider, I look at that and I think that's a problem. But maybe like that, that is such a, uh, like a, a, an incredibly prickly and just disgusting job to wade in that it takes somebody who's been there for 47 years to know where all the dead bodies are and how to manipulate and get people. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've had both those feelings too. Uh, it's, uh, I've looked at it as though it's like WWE, like it's, it's the same shit. And the people that put signs in their yard that say vote for this guy or vote for that guy are as bad as people that have like an undertaker shirt on, in the WWE audience that believe that shit's real. It's so yeah. tribal. I was trying to do a bit about it on stage where it's like, it's like Eagles fans, you know, that they were cheering for Michael Vick, you know, like yeah. they don't yeah. give a fuck that he murdered dogs or whatever he did. They, well, the know. problem was, is they actually <laughs> had like a pit bull stuffed animals <laughs> that they would like uh, put in nooses and like they would, they, they had them on like sticks while they were wearing Vic jerseys cheering him. <laughs> So like they like like the the Philly fans are some of the greatest human beings on the planet, but also have some of the oddest senses of humor I've ever seen. Like I, I mean, just like oh god, there there, there was like uh, I remember we were running on the field and this guy was holding a sign up that said Freddie Mitchell had sex with my girlfriend, <laughs> and people were high fiving him. I don't know if I ever told you the story about I used to do sports radio in New York. Yeah. And, and my co-host was this guy, Sid Rosenberg. And he looks and exactly like a Sid Rosenberg. And I, uh, I've met plenty of Sid Rosenbergs. And Sid is now doing... Sydney. Like, yeah, Sydney. he's now on the fan, I think. And okay. uh, he was just, he was a, I shouldn't, yeah, he was a crackhead. I'll say it, because he was like a crackhead. Mm -hmm. Like he had a, he had an addiction. He had a gambling addiction. Um, he was an idiot. Is this by, uh, by, by uh, Hunter Biden? <laughs> yeah, same thing. So they were uh, running mates. Yeah, they were homeboys. So Sydney, uh, Sydney was a huge Giants and Mets fan. Like he was like Rain Man when it came to sports. He knew every, you know, how many. He, he if I brought you up, he'd be like, "Oh yeah, he had uh, the, 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 the blocks in this game." And you just be like, "Shut up." Anyway, Sydney went uh, one time down to the Eagles game with his family, his dad, oh. his mom, him in their uh, wrapped van, you know, it was wrapped yeah. with uh, the Giants on it and everything. And he said, uh, I said, how was it? He said, they spit on my dad's bald head. They called <laughs> my mom a cunt and they flipped over our van. <laughs> <laughs> he, dude, he, he got away lately. Um, I remember... Uh, one time after practice, they like wheeled this dude out in like a kind of like a wheelchair and he was all like fucked up and he had these like crazy ass like things with all these like, dude, just the guy looked like, uh, you know, the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb had been dropped on him and he had been one of our fans that went to a Giants game and like at the, the Meadowlands, there was this really long staircase and I guess he like takes the first or second step down and his son was like holding his hand was who was holding onto the railing. Some dude karate kicked him in the back. <laughs> the guy tumbled down like seven flights of like concrete stairs, shattered like every bone in both arms, fucked his neck up. They had to like go in and basically like surgically attach all these. And he had this like huge erector set attached. And he was like, you know, and I'm just thinking like, you're at this game, like you show up, you pay money, you go to this ticket to see your plane plan, and some fan karate kicks you in the back and literally almost kills you. 
And like, I, I just like during t- uh, TV timeouts, we would sit there and just watch people <laughs> just beating the shit out of each other and thinking like, you know, and so it was funny. People were like, well, what do you think? You know, like, uh, start talking about pro football. I'm like, I got paid to beat people's asses while uh, fat drunk people got fucking tried to beat each other up. Did you? Like, ever, it was the funniest deal. Did you ever see the Bill Burr in Philadelphia video? <laughs> no, but no. you've never seen this. Uh, uh-uh. I, oh. I can. I'll, I'll Google it though. Oh my god. It's maybe quite possibly that it made Bill Burr's career. Uh, not, uh, Bill's oh. look. Bill's a brilliant comedian. He's funny, but he never would be where he is without Philadelphia, and it was. It's well, monumental. His, his brand of humor is like the average Philadelphian sense of humor. Let me tell you what happened. So. Opie and Anthony had a big oh, Philadelphia yeah, contingent, and they uh, dude, did. I, I I met Opie and Anthony. <laughs> uh, the girl, yeah, no, I met those guys. The whole Whip It Out Wednesday. Yep, yep. I mean, those guys, like, I mean, they went out on such a uh, a fucking like they were like like a bomb going in, and those dudes like unbelievable. What a career! Yeah, they were on WIP or uh, no WYSP, and yeah. they were WNEW in New York, where yeah. I was mornings. They were afternoons, oh, and shit. I used to share an office with them and. Anyway, they did a virus. They called it the virus tour because their fans were called the virus or something. So they took their big, big uh, fan base in Philly. They go to Philly to do a show and they have like 10 comics on the show, which is a bad idea. You should never have more than like four comics and an MC on a show because people just get tired and frustrated. So they put all these big name comics that are on their show, plus some big name Philly guys like Dom Irera and Jimmy Schubert, guys that came out of Philly. And the crowd, the scumbags that they are, 10,000 of them are just... Where was this at? They, it was right over the bridge in, in, in New Jersey, but, you know, they oh, were all Philly yeah, fans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. and uh, they're like, they're just booing everyone. They're, they booed Patrice <laughs> O'Neill off stage. They, they booed... So Bill Burr's backstage getting ready for his booing. And uh, he comes out and he's supposed to do like 10 minutes or something. And they start booing him. And he's like, really? Really? And he just starts ripping Philly apart. He's like, your your baseball team's named after a female horse. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, your hockey team wore slacks for a while. Remember when they wore slacks? He's like, you don't even have a real hero in this town. You have an imaginary statue of an imaginary person. <laughs> Meanwhile, he goes, Joe Frazier is one of the greatest boxers of all time. And you have Rocky up there because you're all fucking racist. And he's just, well, you know what it is, is uh, I think that a lot of people in Philly thought Rocky was a documentary. <laughs> like, I, I swear to God, like, like that was like one of our jokes and be like, Oh, you've seen the rock, uh, the Philly documentary. They're like the movie Philadelphia. You're like, no, no, no. You saw Rocky, right? That was a documentary. That wasn't a movie that really happened. Well, they, uh, Yeah, so they start booing him, and he starts going, nine minutes, and I'm not leaving. And he counts down the whole thing and just keeps ripping on them. And he's like, you're all bald. Every one of you has a shaved head. (laughs) He's like, I'd like to fucking whack you in the head with a beer bottle right now. And uh, he's like, you're going to go home and beat your girlfriends. And he just keeps going, 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 going. By the end, standing ovation. Uh, So he goes from getting booed to standing ovation, and that's like the Philly crowd. They just... You know they're they're yeah. children of abuse, and they just want they want it. Uh, there, there's a uh, it, it definitely coming from California. Like uh, the first year in Philly, I was just like, like couldn't even wrap my head around one the way people talk to each other, <laughs> and two like just like the whole like general discourse. And then you're like there for a couple of years, and it makes sense, and you meet people in here, and then you just like somehow like it's uh when i go back to philly it's like throwing on like an old uh leather jacket that i haven't worn in a while i'm like yeah. oh let me slip this on and so last time i was there was probably man about a year ago one of my wife's friends is a pretty high-end chef and he had like a like a little like bitch and steakhouse that was in Bryn Mawr. so he was uh, uh you know decided he was going to get out because i guess he's doing a bunch of like a bunch of private stuff so we flew out and went to like the last night of his steakhouse. They had like a big going away party and um, we stayed downtown and it was just like, like just walking around and like the places we went and how, like, it just, uh, like, it just makes me chuckle. Cause I'm like, it doesn't even matter. Like, uh, you know, it could, you know, 20 years goes by the whole place cleans out, new people come in and it's the exact same fucking edge on people. Yep. My, my father-in-law, 
uh, played at the Eagles too, and and had me one day. He said we had to go to Philly for something like a family function, and he said, "Hey, uh, we're going to go do a tour of Philly. I'm going to show you around." Me, my wife, my sis- sister in law, and her husband, and then the two of the, him and his wife. He's like, "I'm going to show you all around." So it was like almost like his tour of like what he would do before games and all this stuff. He was telling me he used to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, driving in his convertible through the streets of Philly before the game and Philly fans would throw fruit. <laughs> and then he took me through like the Italian district. Yeah, yeah, and he kept yeah take, the Italian market. He kept taking me into these cheese stores and guys knew who he was. Oh, They're yeah. like, Dennis. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah. then we went to Tony Luke's. Yeah. And, you know, he had his picture on the wall there. And he's like, yeah, this Dude. is where I'd come to get my, uh, fr- uh, my pork roll. Oh yeah, no. I mean, if uh, if you're from that area, if you're from South Philly, and you're like a real like like uh, the Pats and Genos is straight up tourist bullshit. Yeah. Like anybody, it's either Nick's roast beef or you go to Tony Luke's. So I mean, we we used to get sandwiches every week from Tony Luke's. So everybody had their own weird concoctions, and I just always remember I'd go pick them up when I was a rookie, and the dude behind the counter would be like. He's like, are you guys smoking dope? He's like, I've never heard crazier fucking orders. You know, and he like would give, would give me these bags and he'd be like, enjoy your weed. I'm like, you know, because because dudes would want like, uh, you know, bacon. And, you know, they'd like want 20 or 30 things. And these guys like, he's like, who the fuck? You know, these fucking eagles guys are smoking yeah. weed, you know. The and por- then there's, uh, pork roll's yeah. damn good, though. Oh, yeah. And then right across from there, there's a, there's a bar called Cheerleaders. That's like a, a bar kind of topless go-go place. I've been there. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and my buddy, Jackie Bam Bam, used to be the DJ at Cheerleaders. And then he ended up getting on the radio. And, dude, he, he had been a strip club DJ for probably like 15 years. So his, like, his DJ-ness was so honed and was so good that they put him on the rock show. And he was on D- uh, WISP, <laughs> the rock show. And it was like, with Jackie Bam Bam. And uh, he used to come to the football games and he would have like a Wellborn jersey or Wellborn or, uh, and he like sewed like Rolling Stones tongues all over it. And like, he's this total like, fucking, like, like rocker dude. He's like, Wellborn, I got Stones tongues. And uh, dude, just like a legendary, like, that's the thing, man. Like there were so many characters that it just was unbelievable. Yeah, because like, I, I, I felt like Invincible was good, but it didn't do it justice nah. of like the real, fi- like, you can't get Mark Wahlberg, who's from Boston. That you need a real Philly actor to do it, who knows Philly. Because I grew up in Pittsburgh, and they they couldn't be more different. The two cities. Yeah. It's so funny. Same state, four hours away from each other, completely yeah. different. The people are completely different, and uh, yeah. I just wish they had done Philly right. See, I I, I grew up my summers on the Jersey Shore, so those well, are yeah, all Phil- uh, Stone Harbor. Okay, and. Oh, yeah. uh, and so I was an ocean lifeguard all through college down there with, um, so all the guys that came down were all Philly guys that played like football or baseball or track or whatever they did at their college sport. And this is what they'd come down and they'd be lifeguards for the summer and sit oh, on the nice. beach and try to get laid and work out all the time. Yeah. And, uh, and they were just, some of them were the biggest scumbags. We had one guy who had sex with as many girls as there were days in the summer. <laughs> Like he, nice. and he now works, I'm sorry, his, I shouldn't maybe say this. His wife works with a friend of mine who was mm-hmm. also on the beach patrol. When he found that out, like she went home one day, she's like, oh, I'm working with blah, blah, blah. He found my friend and he's like, look, we need to have a talk. <laughs> he's like, Don't out me. he's like, you can't tell uh, my wife anything about the like he, he used his nickname of the old days he's like that person doesn't exist anymore we it was like frank the tank we've put him to sleep and you my we, wife we don't need frank the tank coming back we had a guy our beach patrol captain if you showed up i weirdly had a girlfriend all through college so i did and i wasn't a scumbag but uh if you showed up in the morning and you had a little burn when you're peeing there was an like on call doctor who i think was like a veterinarian who you would go a little penicillin? Shot. Yeah, you would you would drive to Wildwood, knock on this guy's door, <laughs> and this guy would take care of you. Oh man, dude, uh, we used to go, man. So um, I had a buddy whose brother 
had a fab shop where they welded tuna towers on boats in Cape May. So like Stone Harbor and that whole area, like Wildwood and them just trying to, oh, Sea Isle. Yeah. So my buddy, Brad Schioli, who played for the Colts, had a house in Sea Isle. And we used to go to this bar in Sea, in sea Isle. God, I cannot remember the name of it, but it was such a shithole. Like, <laughs> I, I, like, I know what it was because um, one of our guards bartended there. Um, oh, and we wherever there was a guard bartending is where we'd all go. It wasn't called the. Sh- it was at the Shore House. Uh, God, I can't remember, man. But it was such a shithole. But uh, Skilly's Beach House was like a like two block walk from it, so we used to go to this place. And dude, it was so awful. Like, like it, it was just like like they didn't even serve drinks, or uh, um, it was like you could get a drink, but everything was in a solo cup. If you wanted a shot, they were in little plastic. It's plastic, <laughs> right? Like there was no glass in the place because they realized that it would at some point it was going to be a weapon, and it was just easier just to fucking like hose the place out of it. And it was so, oh, it stunk. And uh, yeah, that was um, man. Philly was a good spot. Like I was trying to tell my kids the other day that like the uh, like the variety of food in philly is yeah. like nothing i've ever seen like we used to go to this bitch in cuban place that was in north philly where like we only could go during daylight because like it like across the street was run by uh um, like a, this gang that was drugs and protection so like we could only drive in during the daylight because at night they just fucking shoot everybody really uh, yeah and it was in north philly it was uh not far from strawberry mansion and um uh where else man like we used to like all, all Steven Starr's bitch in restaurants. I mean, there were so many cool spots like Nick's Roast Beef. I mean, there were so many places that like, if what, you just went there, you would never know about. But after living there five, six years, like you just get plugged in. What was and, your like, favorite cheesesteak? Um, I wasn't a huge cheesesteak guy, but uh, if I was going to take somebody, I always thought that uh, Jim's on South yep, was pretty that's, good. That's my favorite. And then uh, for a sandwich, it was either Nick's Roast Beef, I thought was the best, and or uh, Tony Luke's. Yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've taken touristy stuff. There was a little sandwich shop that was actually around the corner from Pat's and Gino's that, um, I, when I, uh, when I lived down in Tampa, um, I met a dude who's, who grew up in South Philly and was part of, uh, uh, well, I guess you could say Philly organized crime. Like his like <laughs> uncle was like a major person and he had yeah. like, you know, so it was pretty funny. Um, he comes to town and I go out with him and like, we go down in the Italian market, you know, he's like, we went in all these places, all these joints that were like playing numbers and like took me through this like total CD place to went to Terminis to get like desserts. And, uh, it was, it was pretty interesting to like get in there and like really see how this place works. And, uh, I do, I had a ton of fun. I remember one night, um, I got invited, this girl I was dating at the time, um, you know, her uncle, <laughs> owned all the recycling plants in Camden, <laughs> right? So uh, the dad, who was a good dude, they lived in Jersey, uh, invites me to this, like, hey, we're having this Christmas party. It's kind of like a bunch of dudes. We go out, like, you know, the girls do something. We do, do you want to come? So he invites me, and I show up to this place, and it was like, it was right on Front Street. I can't remember the life of me. But it was like kind of like a wise guy, like gangster hangout. So like it was like big stakes and the whole deal. So I cruise in, I go in this back room, I'm sitting with all these guys and uh, like just having a good time. Like they're popping, you know, like one, everybody's dressed, everybody's got like fucking jewelry, you know, the whole deal. They're older and big wine drinks. I mean, this fucking party was epic. Um, The next day I go to work and our chief of security, who was also had been a Philly cop and a South Philly guy, calls me. And it's like, hey, uh, I heard that uh, you were at this spot last night with some characters and some people. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I went to this, uh, uh, you know, Goodfellas Christmas party, you could say. And uh, he's like, well, I just got a call from the FBI that um, some of the people you were sitting with are obviously uh, under observation, surveillance. So just know. And I was like, uh, and he was kind of like mentioned a few names. I'm like, oh, yeah, I met that guy. I met that guy. (laughs) And the guy's like, uh, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, no, that would her, her uncle Carmine, right? Like, uh, you know, he's fine. And he's like, no, 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 no. So it was, um, it was pretty good, man. I, I had a, a fun time and like got to go to some really cool spots and really just got to like insert myself into that Philly situation. I'm yeah, like, M- my father-in-law played back in the '70s, late '70s, early '80s. So he. I mean, they, they made like shit money back then. I think his yeah. most he made was like one hundred and sixty thousand or something. But he yeah. would he would bounce at bars on the on the during the summer, and oh, nice. uh, 
and he had some shady character friends and uh there's one that's like my wife's like uncle you know yeah. and uh at at her sister's wedding i'm there this guy comes up to me and he's like so uh so you're with lauren and i'm like yeah and he's like well lauren's my goddaughter and i just want you to know that if anything happens to her anything i'll kill you <laughs> You're like, do we really need to have this conversation? And, and I, I, I was like, I walked away and I'm like to my wife, I'm like, does he think he's funny? And she's like, no, he's serious. And I go, he was totally, completely serious. And she's like, yeah, I go, he's like a character, uh, yeah, caricature out of a movie. And she's yeah. like, and I'm like, he's an old man. And she's like, yeah, he's, and I go, what's he think? He's like mafia. My wife's like, I think he is. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like. Okay, I. Uh, I'm so, not mess so with the them. the uh, the code name that we used to hear a lot was uh, so and so's people that knows people. Oh. <laughs> so that was a pretty funny one, being like, "Oh, so and so is like uh, those are people that know people," or like, um, and then one time somebody was like, "No, they're people." <laughs> like that was like a funny one, but like people, like the age old, like oh, like or um, you know, and and I, dude, I, I used to run into this all the time when we would work with some military guys that were or some you know contractors or clandestine individuals that would say, uh, "I did some stuff with some people that did some stuff," <laughs> and that was another one. So I got reached out to and, and worked with a, a a group of individuals who, you know, wherever they fall within the paradigm of you know that type of stuff. But I just remember like uh as the guy was like talking about this guy or this and i was like oh i know oh yeah no no i did some stuff with some people that did some stuff and i always thought that that was like the equivalent and like the philly like kind of situation where like people that knows people no i did some stuff with some people that did some stuff what kind of what would you do with the special forces guys were you training them yeah so we we have worked with naval special warfare for mm -hmm. almost the last 10 years and we work with the guys at development group uh helping them not only with performance but training and, um, you know, go in there, implement power athlete systems with those guys. And then I worked uh, on this resiliency project with uh, uh, the other side, you know, of Naval Special Warfare and taught a series of seminars all over the globe. So we start, I started that, geez, almost 10 years ago. And you're and still so doing still it? Pretty, yeah, we still have a pretty good relationship. And right now we've just been working with the guys uh, at Development Group, but we work with a ton of the other guys just individually. So, um, you know, guys that haven't made it to Development Group. Oh, to, um, to, just more in the end. Yeah. To so, like so prep them? Of, no, I mean, so, so like there's the regular SEAL teams, mm -hmm. uh, you know, East Coast, West Coast, right. like the guys at Coronado and Little Creek. And then at Damn Nick, you know, they, those guys all kind of funnel and try out for something called Green Team. And then from there, they get selected. And if they make it through, then they go to development group, which is at Damn Nick. Okay. So, so that's, um, but yeah, those guys have always been, um, you know, real hard chargers and a really good audience and customer base and just, you know, a community that we're happy to service. And I'm always stoked to work with those. Guys. I, had a, I had a cousin that was running all the teams out of Little Creek. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the guy who introduced me to CrossFit. And I always ask every SEAL I've ever met. And he was like super high up. He was a captain, almost an admiral. And everyone at me, it's like, nah, don't know. <laughs> and I'm well, like, I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's an interesting community of people, I think. And, uh, I know that like the enlisted guys, like um, one of our you know good friends, who's I think he's just actually turning his retirement papers after 23, 24 years. Uh, you know, he was a uh, you know graduated from college, but he enlisted uh, and didn't go as an officer because he wanted to kick indoors and he wanted to yeah. be a you know forward operator. And I think like when those guys go in, especially at that officer level. Um, you know, they might get maybe two or three swings at the Apple, a couple deployments, and then they put those guys more into an operations role. So I know that the guys who want to kick indoors and, you know, do badass shit tended to be the enlisted guys. Yeah. So. Yeah. I heard that when I was, when I was in college, cause that was like always my dream. I was like, I'm going to go into the Navy. I'm tried to drop out of college and do it. And my cousin's like, what's your eyesight? And I was like, uh, like, I forget what it is. It's so bad. He's like, you're never going to be in. And I'm like, they told me, yeah. he's like, don't believe a word they say. They're lying to you. You're going to be on a submarine somewhere, like no. watching a radar screen. He's like, don't, don't, don't fall for their bullshit. He's like, you have to have perfect 2020 vision or you're not going. Yep. And uh, he's like, I don't care how fit you are or what you think you can do. Your eyes have booted you out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there, there's definitely limitations. I think that if they were to, 
somehow do some genetic testing or whatnot, I mean, or behavioral type of stuff, they could probably find a commonality for why, you know, certain individuals, like whether it be mindset, whether it be growing up or whatever, but like certain people, like I met, uh, you know, guys that were like, I loved blood, but I loved every minute of yeah. it. I love the training yeah. and like, you know, and then there's other people that are like, this was the hardest thing. And, you know, it's just, I really think that stuff comes down. It's like playing in the NFL too. You know, you, you meet some guys who, you know, played a year and talk about it and other guys that played longer and are like, Oh, it was a great time. And we had a lot of fun and I would do it again. And, you know, hopefully I come out the other side, you know, not nearly as damaged as some other people. Did you ever read grit by Angela Duckworth? Oh yeah. We, we had her on our podcast. We had her on power athlete radio. Cause she talked about that with West point where she could basically do testing and figure out who was going to make it through West point. I yep. didn't know. I didn't know how hard it was to make it through. I, I didn't know how tough West Point was. Yeah. I mean, I, I think people think they go to West Point, like it's some physical test. Uh, it's really the academics yeah. and like the way they, they put you into it. So I had a buddy at a high school who got appointed and went to West Point. And uh, he, when he got in there and realized that it really wasn't a lot of rah-rah army stuff, that it was like mathematics and this, I mean, like the, the level of, uh, you know, intellectual prowess that you had to have to be successful he fucking pulled the ripcord after like, you know, half like a half a year. Or so, I mean, he ended up bailing out at like mid semester, I guess there's like, they'll, they'll let you go. And then there's a point where like, you have to commit and he just fucking pulled the ripcord. And I remember like he had prepared for this for so long. And I was like, dude, like, he's like, it's not what I thought. I'm like, yeah, life's not what you fucking thought, but like, <laughs> fucking like you know like um, i'm always amazed in people's willingness to make a decision at 18 that would uh, potentially you know change the, the trajectory of their whole life you know so yeah but i think it's hard when you're 18 like uh uh you know to have a perspective like that because you, you you just think uh, most kids i think think instant gratification and they're not thinking mm -hmm. big picture i mean i know i i look at some of the decisions i made back then uh you know i was looking when i was looking at colleges to go to I was being recruited by everyone on the East Coast just because track's not a sport where they put a lot of money. And I reached out. I told my track coach, I go, hey, can you reach out to like Colorado Boulder and see if, you know, I can go run there? And he's like, yeah, I'll call their coach. You know, and he's like, yeah, sure. They'd love to have you. And I was like, yeah, that's where I'm going. Because in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to go skiing every day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm using this to get me to a ski resort. And my dad was like, are you running track or are you going to be a ski bum? And I was like, uh, I'm going to uh, do both. And my dad's like, no, you're not. You're doing one or the other. And uh, and then I was like, all right, I'll go to Arizona State. Because I was like, Arizona State, I'll be there, hot chicks in the sun, blah, blah, blah. And my dad's like, no. <laughs> like, like, are you an idiot? And I, that was my perspective was I want to do everything. Because I didn't, at that young age, I had zero focus and knew, like, I also didn't, I guess, believe in myself at a young age that I could do things or, or, and track to me was like, what future do you have in track anyways? Like, I'm not going to be at the Olympics. So why not, sure. why not use it to parlay me into like other fun shit? But, sure. but in retrospect, if I, I look back, I go, Oh, you know, maybe if I'd focused and done this and done this and done this, I could have, you know, succeeded at other things. But, you know, I was all for, and that's why I look at guys that go to like, uh, like, the military academy and like you're going to give up those four amazing years of college life like even in a football player you're devoting yourself to football but you have an incredible college experience probably better than anyone yeah i mean i you know if i had known i was going to play in the nfl for 10 years i probably would have gone to arizona state i mean like <laughs> i uh like i remember we went out there uh and like i was like we went to like um uh I think we went out there for spring break or I forgot, I, I, like, I forgot how we went. I was out there when I was in college and I remember we went to like the ASU rec center and like any girl that like in there that walked on Berkeley would have been the hottest, one of the hottest <laughs> girls. Under. And I just remember thinking like, you know, I'm over there, like, you know, at Berkeley, you know, I'm going to get this good degree and I'm going to go into the future on this. And I was like, man, if I had known, I probably would have just gone and had a hell of a time at Arizona state. But then uh, I, you know, here I am now, years later, I'm much happier to have that like, Berkeley degree on the wall than at ASU. Like nobody's fucking bragging about attending ASU. No, no. And, and Berkeley probably gave you a lot of like the ability to do some of the things that you do too. Yeah, like yeah. outside of even like running your business that, that, you know, people look at somebody that runs a business like you and they're like, oh, it's all physical training. It's like, no, it's not. You're running a business. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, our, our business is, uh, 
you know, uh, there is a physical component that's the product we sell, but at the end of the day, like it's a, uh, you know, full fledged business in the way that we run this thing. So it's, it's pretty strategic in that way. But, you know, I, I, I didn't go to, uh, I didn't go to school for this stuff. I'm kind of a, a accidental entrepreneur in a lot of ways. I mean, my goal was uh, to go to law school. So really? uh, I, I was a rhetoric major. What the hell's um, rhetoric? Like an English philosophy. <laughs> okay. So uh, with an argumentative approach. Uh, so when I took a trip to Berkeley, uh, as a youngster, uh, and they asked me what I was interested in. And I was like, I want, you know, I wanted to be an attorney. So they gave me, a um, or set me up with this guy named Adrian Cragen, who had been the Dean of the, of the law school at Bolt Hall. And he was like, still had an office there and was like a, you know, fill in professor old dude. So I got to go meet with him and, uh, you know, he asked me a little bit about, you know, where I grew up in this. And it turned out that the, uh, the old lawyer that apprenticed my dad, when he was a young attorney and him were friends, this guy can't red wine. So, uh, we kind of connected on that and I asked him, I'm like, what do you think I should major in? And he's like, well, there's a, 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 a major here at Berkeley that's pretty unique in that there's only a few other schools that have it. It's called rhetoric. And what it is, is it's uh, reading and writing, which what you need to do the best of your ability to be a good attorney. But everything is written from this, like proving an argument, like the, you know, the oratory part, you know, and he goes, if you look back at the Greeks and, uh, you know, the Romans, the idea of like, you know, uh, rhetoric and argument and, you know, presentation and this, he goes, I think it'd be a really good major for you. So I took, you know, when uh, I was a, a freshman, I had to take like an English deal and I chose rhetoric 1A and 1B and absolutely loved it. Oh, wow. Like read books, write papers, get up, talk, prove, uh, you know, Socratic method, all that. And um, that was my major. So I did that. And then I graduated in four years and got a master's or worked on my master's in my fifth year in education. So, why, why didn't you do law school? Because of the NFL? Yeah, I was planning on it. Uh, they have, or they had, they still do. They have a, a, this, something called the Adrian Cragen Scholarship, which was for a four-year Cal Letterman to go to Bolt Hall. So I had been kind of hot on that and uh, figured I would just go play in the NFL for a year or two. I mean, I really know how long people yeah. play. Wow. Uh, make a little bit of dough and then go back to law school. And then a few years turned into 10. Why don't you do the uh, Kim Kardashian law degree thing? Uh, isn't where you just donate money and they give you a degree? Yeah. No, I think what she's doing is pretty much like a at home study and then she's got to pass the bar. She talked about it on uh she did the interview with Dave Letterman which was mm -hmm. it, it was it was pretty interesting to watch Letterman with her because he had so much disdain for her for so oh. long. He and still does. No, he was very uh you know, he basically admitted he said, "Look, you couldn't be where you are without having something special." He's like, "You can't be as successful as you are." He's like, I used to make fun of you. I used to uh, think you were famous for being famous. And he's like, but you well, would. Well, she was famous for a sex tape. But what she did is she used that and parlayed it into like this fucking empire. Right. I and mean, the fact that her, you know, uh, like young sister has basically like, and whether or not they argue whether or not she's a billionaire or not, she's still damn close. Yeah. Basically selling makeup in, uh, you know, um, Instagram funnels for billions of like it's fucking unbelievable unbelievable like, uh, and that's what yeah, Letterman I mean, said Letterman said he goes you wouldn't be sitting on my show right now if there wasn't something special about you yeah if you were just getting if you were just some chick who got railed by Ray J yeah I mean uh <laughs> like you know but a, a pretty interesting like you know Bob Kardashian who was her dad uh you know pretty famous attorney uh, my dad knew Bar Bob Kardashian. Oh, really? And um, yeah, so my dad was a you know LA attorney, you know, for fifty. I think he was fifty five years uh, practice law before he passed away. Oh yeah, you grew up and in he, Palos Verdes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, uh, you know, my dad knew um, you know Shapiro. He knew uh, you know uh, Kardashian and um, uh, who was the other guy? There was another dude. Yeah, Cochran. He he wasn't a big fan of Cochran. There there was another um, black attorney who was kind of a contemporary of Cochran, who was a good friend of my dad's. That I cannot remember the life. Of, it'll come to me. In he a wasn't second. on the defense. He was on the prosecution. Yeah, no. Well, um, you, you know, uh, uh, my dad also, when he was a young lawyer, was a DA and actually uh, in the in the district attorney's deal with Bugliosi, who was the guy that uh, did the Charlie Manson deal. Oh wow. Yeah. So. Um, God, what is that? What was that? Uh, Charlie Lloyd. Charlie Lloyd okay. was the name of the other attorney who was another big time guy, black attorney. In yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the Manson stuff now. I've started to just get into that right now because. Yep. Uh, Did you see that new book that just came out? No. I, it... I, um, There's a new book that just came out uh, and Rob Wolf's wife, Nikki uh, Violetti, 
uh, was 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 reading it, and she sent me a link, and I ordered it, and I think I have it somewhere. I gotta go send me it. send me the link because I will. Um, the the Brad Pitt film, uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio, what's it called the Quentin Tarantino. Did you read Helter Skelter? Have you read Helter Skelter? Yeah, a lo- long time ago. I've got to read it again. I read it. I I got into serial killers for a little bit, but then I read that serial killers read about serial killers, so I had to stop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, the new book is called Chaos, uh, Charlie Manson, the CIA, and uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. I think is I think it's the do you is the do new you book. I I've heard this rumor that he hung out. I think it was Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. Yeah, that he was hanging out at his house. I think in the Palisades or something for a while, and apparently well, he, he would like bring the chicks by. Everybody was like, "Yeah, this Manson dude knows all the hot chicks," and he would bring them by. And then Brian Wilson kicked him out because everybody got gonorrhea. Yeah, I, I do. I uh, the whole thing is that I guess allegedly, uh, you know, Bugliosi was in on it, but like Manson was a uh, you know a CIA operative and you know had what was a paid informant. And there was a lot of stuff with him. So uh, yeah, I gotta I, I want to pull this one up. But there's some, you know, super interesting man. Like uh, I always think that like you know, and I always go back to two things. One, uh, you know, Johnny Cash, which is uh, what's done in the dark comes to the light. You know, that's one of the lines of one of his songs I think about all the time is like, eventually everything comes out. Like eventually we learn the story. <laughs> like Cosby. You know, it doesn't, yeah, it, it like, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, like the Bill Cosby thing, uh, like everything always comes to the light. And then the other one is, is um, you know, I think in this world, everybody hopes that like God punishes the wicked. He doesn't. God, God punishes the weak. And like, that's like, if, if you can remember that about our society, like the people that tend to get punished the most are the weak, not the wicked. And, uh, you know, when people are like, oh, how come this doesn't happen? Or, you know, these are bad people. And I'm like, Darwinism. Yeah. Like, when did you assume that, like, because bad people do bad things, that there's some like good and balance? Like, you know, I think if anything, we've seen in this political landscape that like, you don't have to be a good person. You just can't be fucking weak. Yeah. And, yeah. and as long as you're strong and you kick the door off of the hinges and keep fucking moving forward with your spears and attacking, 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 eventually you'll get where you want to go. This idea of fair play and being a good person and right, like that fucking doesn't exist. I've, I've seen it with, the, you know, because the Me Too thing is like crushed my business and it, they've gone after so many comedians in so many different ways. And it, it comes in waves where they'll attack three or four comedians and it's usually white men. And, uh, and then it'll stop for a little bit and then they'll go on it again. And it's usually whoever's really successful is, at the time. Is it found? It, is it, uh, is it like baseless or, or is the here, base? Here, or? Here's the thing. We're, we're all living in glass houses. Everybody's done something wrong. Everybody sure. said stuff wrong I, or, or that was wrong 10 years ago, or I mean, wasn't wrong 10 years ago. That's wrong now. I mean, well, I, there's, you, there's, you can't, you can't judge the past with the lens of the future. Like, this is what's so difficult. And I was, uh, like, I was, um, geez, uh, I don't know if you know much about guns, but uh, I got a buddy, Scott Volkorsen, who makes these bitchin', like, super precision 22 rimfire rifles. Like, in terms of, like, 22 rimfire, like, precision type shit, this dude's stuff is so fucking epic. Um, he's in he's in Iowa, and we're just, uh, I, I met him at uh, Winterstrong with Sornex. And we just become buddies and he hits me up and I'd like, uh, you know, he'll, he'll ask me like, Hey, what do you think of this? And I'll send him like, Hey, buy this book. This is good. And just, we've turned, he listens to uh, power athlete radio too. So, but, uh, we were talking actually earlier today and he's like, you know, when do you think this change was? And I sent him the coddling of the American mind. And I was like, Hey man, like read this, you'll see what happened where there was this change where it was like, you know, uh, you know, we have to pr- protect people from everything. There can't be any language. Like if, if, if what you're saying causes me stress and we know stress to be, uh, you know, damaging, now you're attacking me. And it's like just this change where no longer could we have intellectual discourse. No longer can people, are you okay with people disagreeing? And if somebody disagrees with you, then you know what, then they're evil. They need to be stomped out and we have to fucking assault them. Yeah, watch, um, watch, watch a joke online. Steve Hughes, he's a buddy by an Australian comedian on a, being offended. It's a, it's a, one of the greatest jokes of all time. Uh, Dude, uh, Bill, Bill Burr had a great, uh, his great deal where he basically offended everybody in three minutes on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I, I like, I, I like, uh, but, but what's crazy is that the woke police don't attack like unilaterally. No. Like D- Dave Chappelle has basically gotten like carte blanche. And I fucking love Dave Chappelle. I'm a huge Dave Chappelle fan. I think Dave Chappelle is fucking genius. 
Um, but he has gotten away with the carte blanche to where like nobody goes after him. Like, uh, you know, he did that stand up where he talked about the alphabet. The transgender. And, yeah. You know, yeah. Transgender. Yeah. And yeah. he talked about the ju- juicy Smollett and yeah. he goes through that whole thing. And he's like, you know, juicy is pretty. You know, and he like absolutely murders these people. I've made the I've made the same point. I've made the same point that it's like, Dave, if you're gonna stand up and and pontificate and kind of do these Hannah Gadsby kind of speeches instead of uh, comedy, well, the you, you got to be fair. I always I've said it on say I go don't, and I'm not like one of these all lives matters persons. I, people I understand, you know about I do understand about what I believe about systematic racism and what I've read in segregation and slavery and all the bad things that have been part of society however i don't believe that you fight discrimination with discrimination (laughs) it's like two wrongs don't make a right and i believe that's what's been going on but not only that with with the me too movement i see a lot of opportunism Mm. tons of opportunism a lot of virtue signaling but but it's it's virtue signaling people know they're just i watch people that are just as guilty you know throwing stones at people because they're like if i can knock him down this is an opportunity for me to move up in the hierarchy. So yeah, it is a bit the, of survival. But, but the world doesn't work like that. You don't succeed because somebody else fails. They believe and that. Though. No, I know. But, but like, that's like a weird thing. Like I remember years ago, I, uh, you know, uh, when I had the, the, that little stint, when I worked with CrossFit for about nine years with CrossFit <laughs> football, uh, I remember when Greg Glassman approached me about doing CrossFit football and I went out there I went out to Arizona and had to, you know, go out and talk to him and hang out. We sat out there and drank beers uh, with Lauren, who was pregnant. She wasn't drinking beers. Um, But in there, uh, Greg asked me, you know, like, what's your business philosophy? And I was like, I don't know. High tide rises all boats. He's like, mine's more like battleship. I got to sink you to win. Hmm. And I remember thinking I should run and not do business (laughs) with this guy. Um, I just thought he was fucking with me, but like there's certain people that, that the only way that they are able to know whether or not they won or lost, the only scorecard they can keep is based off of your success or your failure. Like, like the fact that there's somebody somewhere who, you know, would fucking leap, leap for joy and feel like they got the best Christmas gift to know that, uh, you know, Eddie F fucked something up or got attacked or this, like, uh, like that's that uh that's a deal where people are so focused on like the perception of others as it relates to themselves that they can't see what they do or they don't do. I saw that with a, a guy I used to work with, another comedian, and he would uh, he wanted he didn't feel good unless everybody else was failing around him, and because it just he had to be so much higher than everyone else. And there were guys that worked with us that were just like low level comedians that were just trying to just make it and anytime they would get a little bit of success he would be upset and meanwhile this guy was becoming a superstar and I'm like why can't they have that little why can't you let them have that little joy what is wrong with or like why can't you help them get success and find joy in 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 you know aiding them and helping them like people have helped you it was really really weird but he was also a narcissist so that could have something Mm. to do with it uh narcissistic personality disorder is uh is a very real deal and i've met some people that were some classic narcissists and there is a real thing of like if the if anybody does anything else that somehow takes away some shine for me then it's negative yeah and i think like there i mean dude playing in the nfl i um like I was always extremely a realist. I was like, I make no illusions about what we do. We get paid a lot of money to push other people around in spandex uh, in front of people that get drunk. Like, I mean, let's not like, we're, we're not out here solving cancer and, you know, uh, ending world hunger and doing this great thing. Like we are basically, you know, paid uh, athletes that get to beat people's asses on live TV while people get hammered and eat hot dogs. Like, let's not fucking make any illusions. Um, and I think the, a lot of times these guys had this, like, and I used to meet dudes that had what I like to think was some classic personality narcissistic uh, disorders who, like, thought that somehow what they were doing was, like, changing the fabric of society and that they were, and, and maybe, you know, maybe that's better, maybe it's worse, but, like, really, uh, like, had an inflated image, to say the least, of what they were doing and, more importantly, the effect they were having on society. 
Yeah, uh, ours is more the uh, for the worst, where the comics don't feel like they're changing society, but they do feel like the world revolves around them, and they really, really do. Somebody was saying that, and I said, the problem is people kiss these people's asses for so long that they just become bigger and bigger assholes because sure. of all the ass kissing. And if you don't have family and friends that keep you humble and keep you grounded, my God. Um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, uh, like I, I always think it would be tough to be a comic because everybody you would meet would try to be funny. No, like that, it does happen I, a really, little bit. It happens a little bit. I, I, dude, I, I, I always laugh. Like I always wonder if, like, uh, you know, like um, it was kind of like. Um, uh, when I played in Philly, we uh, Paul Rudd was a, is a big Kansas City Chiefs fan. So uh, I came out after, and he was in our parking lot, and he was talking to Will Shields. And I came over, and he introduced me. And then, like, we all went out and got beers a few times with Paul Rudd. And, like, the hilarious part was is, like, dudes that were drinking, like, all of a sudden, like, wanted him to, like, hey, do this line for me from Anchorman and, like, started <laughs> pushing him on it. And he was, like, pretty stoked. And, like, he's, like, a really good nature, just a fun. I've like, heard that. I've heard he's a super like, nice guy. Yeah. And funny. He, he, yeah, funny, like good sense of humor, really good timing. Like I'm sure you've met people that were like funny but didn't have good timing. Like yeah. they didn't know how to drop the exact line. His timing was really good. It was effort. Like in was in just... in the comedy circle of like comedic actors, he's like legendary. I, yeah. I've I've always been like, yeah, he's kind of funny watching him in movies. But they all talk about him like he's Michael Jordan, and I yeah, didn't he... know that. Yeah, no, he uh, super, very, very nice. But like, uh, we were sitting there, and and like, of course, we want to know lines from Anchorman. So we're like, dude. And wh whereas I'm more interested in like the craft of how they got to there, I was like, first of all, who came up with this shit? He's like, well, we did. Like, what we would do is everybody would take their lines, go home, and rewrite them, mm -hmm. and then drop them on people fresh, so that we could try to get Will Ferrell to basically break character. And so, like the whole thing where it's like sixty percent of the time it works every time, but Will or like somebody's like that makes no sense. Like all of that was like first take, like the first time they dropped, and like Sex Panther, and he like went through this whole thing that they would just and I like that piece was so interesting to me that these you know these scriptwriters had written this script and then these actors you know comedians come in and basically totally put their own spin on it and turn it into a competition to who can fuck with each other the best. Uh, you know, is really w what makes a comedic deal. And then you have a guy like Will Ferrell. Like I always imagine with Will Ferrell, everywhere he goes, everybody's trying to be funny with him to the point where he's like, just stop. I think don't he, I, I've heard, I, and I don't know Will, I've met him a few times, but I had, I used to have, my manager was a guy named Jimmy Miller. Um, Jimmy is Dennis Miller's brother. And Jimmy is 10 times more successful than Dennis. Jimmy manages Will Ferrell, Sasha Baron Cohen, Oh, shit. Uh, uh, He's G a funny fucking dude. Jim, oh, my God. Jim Carrey, Sarah Silverman, Daniel Todd. I mean, this guy has everyone. Yeah. Jay Roach, Judd Apatow. So he had that whole group. And so I would see outtakes and stuff like this. And I think you can see it in, um, uh, what's the movie? Step Brothers. They do mm -hmm. a lot of the outtakes. What, what goes on is the director will direct the scene. And they'll, it's almost like commercial directing where they'll have a line and Will will just start improving like a one line thing. Like, say, like he'll be like yelling across the yard. Like, this was the Step Brothers things where he's like, hey guys, you know, like, hurry, dirty, did, you know, he's trying to, I don't know if you remember the scene where he's trying to have them not sell the house. And he's like, yeah, yeah. hey, the, the Nazi parties is going on at four o'clock. So make sure you bring the cookies over, you know. And he just keeps like throwing out lines. And you see Will just improv a line and then they're just going to edit whichever one works best. So he's doing like 50 tries at it and everybody around is just laughing, but they're also yelling lines to him to say. So if somebody thinks they have a funnier line, because I, I worked on a TV show once where I was a writer and that's what you do. You just go, try saying this, try saying this, try. So people don't realize that at the end product, they tried a hundred different lines and oh, you just found you. the one that was so fucking funny. And that's why I get frustrated that we don't have more funny movies because mm. there, uh, there were a lot of funny people. But the other problem though is uh, I think Hollywood is, is such a man. Like I almost think like the sooner we could get movies away from Hollywood, it's on its like, way. Uh, it's on its I'm, way. I'm, 
and and with this Netflix deal and like these big studios and this and like I it was it was funny um did you see Brad Pitt's acceptance speech for like the Golden Globes I think is what when he got up there and he's like I think they gave it to him for uh Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and he's like yeah it was about um you know a guy that smokes too much and has a bad relationship with his wife and he was just pretty funny but he, he in there made a funny point he's like I love our community of people we do this amazing work and I was like I, I like I I don't know if people are into your manufactured heroes anymore. I mean, I think like Brad Pitt, like nobody blamed him for that Angelina Jolie thing because she's insane. So like, uh, but like, I think a lot of this stuff, man, especially with like the rise in Netflix and these other streaming deals, I feel like that power structure has really separated where, you know, there's so much more interesting stuff, more so than what we're spoon fed in these, you know, major fucking bullshit. Well, if you're looking at all these series on Netflix, because nobody, the way things are going now, and I'm talking with a writer right now, who's a Steven Spielberg writer who I'm working with. And he's like, I keep writing scripts. And he's like, stop writing scripts. It's over. There aren't movies. You make a series. It's yeah. all series now. He's like, don't write a script, write a series. And he's like, you have to come up with an interesting character that's global. He's like, we no longer just make movies for the United States. We make sure, movies sure. that they're going to watch. They watch Breaking Bad in every country of the world. You have to sure. make a series that's going to resonate and has to be so unique. And then the best part about that is then you cast it with just – there's so many weird real actors out there that aren't famous yeah. that you just put in there that nobody knows and it doesn't matter because it's a unique story yeah. that so we don't have to have superstars anymore. And I I don't know if you felt this way. I got so fucking tired of award season of watching these celebrities go on stage and pat each other on the back for oh my god. It was amazing to work with him. He's so brilliant. He's a genius. And this, da, da, da. and it's like, you guys do the easiest job in the world. You sit in a trailer all day long. You walk out for 10 minutes. You stand under a light. You recite some lines that you memorize, and you go back into your trailer. Shut yeah, you pretend, the fuck You pretend to be somebody else. You yeah. Know? I'm, like it's, 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 yeah. I heard, well, it, I, I heard uh, Ed Norton. <laughs> Ed Norton on Rogan's podcast said it's the gayest business in the world. He goes, he goes, think about what we do. He goes, we all play dress up with makeup on. And, try, and, and you pretend to be somebody else. Yeah, like it's, be, it's, it, well, well, that's a disadvantage. Goes, oh, right? the, and, line, and, the, and, the line he used was, behind every great actor, there's a great actress. <laughs> Well, the other one, too, is uh, and, and then we get into this situation where you have Hollywood and these actors like lecturing us. Uh, and I'm like, you pretend to be somebody else for a living. Yeah. Like, who are you to lecture me? Like, you live in this extremely bubble and people kiss your ass. It's because like, their asses are kissed. Yeah. Because when they come around, because I'm around them all the time, you know, I sit in the green rooms with them. And there's a different there's like you just I don't know if this happened in sports, but. Like the table will change. We'll all be sitting at the table eating and all of a sudden someone like Chris Rock will sit down and or Seinfeld or Chappelle. And the, the dynamic of the cha table completely changes. And there becomes this uh, all of a sudden you have to everybody acts differently. And the the celebrity is like untouchable. Whereas before that happened, the gloves were off. And everybody's swinging at each other. But as soon as the celebrity sits down, there's no more, no more swinging. It's just really? ask. Yeah. And it, it, it oh, kind of man. irritates I, me. I, I, yeah. Like if, if, if Chappelle sits down, oh my God, dude, I, I would, uh, I'd be like, Dave, we got to talk. Like, <laughs> you know, like he, I, I'll tell you, like, I, I, I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate and I, and I really, I like, it's an interesting psychology, like why he's so untouchable. Uh, you know, and the other guy who's so funny, man, and like is almost kind of retreated. I love Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. I think Seinfeld is he's around. So he's smart. around a lot. He hasn't retreated. He's Jerry yeah. is uh, I like I, he he won't go on college campuses anymore. I don't think anybody will go on college campuses no. anymore. But like um, I watched all the cars and coffee stuff with him. And uh, I think Seinfeld is so smart. And he's such a like he's another guy where everything is very, very very simple, very natural, very easy. He's not trying to be funny, but is it, he's a, he's, he's a talented dude. I did. Uh, I used to do about a hundred colleges a year and I made wow. so much money doing it. 
And it was when I was like, a, you go from being an opener to a feature act to a headliner. Mm -hmm. And when you're an opener, you're literally making like $50 a show. When you're a feature, you're making like 500 bucks a week. And you got to like get yourself there. And when you're a headliner, you can make anywhere from like a couple thousand to, you know, a hundred thousand a weekend. It's like crazy. When I was a feature act before I was a headliner, I got into colleges and everybody told me there's a lot of money, but it sucks. And I was like, why does it suck? They're like, cause sometimes you'll be performing at lunchtime to four people. And I was like, I don't give a fuck for that money. I'm, I'll in. Do I'm in. And I literally, that happened. I was in cornfields. I was in, but I would go sometimes and do two colleges in a day. I'd drive around like, yeah, you don't know these colleges exist, but there's like, sure. we'd go to these conferences. You perform for the, the college or all the kids. And then afterwards they, you go into like a trade show where there's booths and they come to your booth and purchase you. And so wow. you have to be a whore at the booth and like schmooze them. And they know it too. These kids like make you work for them. Like they're slave traders. Like you, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta work for these kids so that they purchase you. And I had had, you know, it was so funny back then there was still stuff about, and I'm, I'm tired, not that probably like 99, 2000, 2001, I'm doing 2002, 2003. I'm still doing colleges. And my agent used to tell me, like, you got to you, please do the most PC stuff on stage. Please, 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 please. And I was like, it's killing me. It's killing me. And she's like, but do you want a lot of bookings? Because you could do the PC show at the at the conference but then the colleges you could get away with it back then like very sure. rarely did the colleges complain except for university of scranton wouldn't pay me because i did a joke about raping the pope and i didn't know it was a religious school um oh, yeah. it was a great joke well i mean uh the fact that you have uh you know what was it uh kingpin you know with Mund with uh, uh woody harrelson playing munson who's from scranton yeah. like there's so many you know, like uh, Ida Felcher, you mean the chick with the hair lip from Scranton? You know, like there's a lot of jokes and I have friends from Scranton. So like, I love beating them up. They, I had no idea. I came in the back door. I had no idea it was a religious school. Everybody like walked out on my show and I'm like, where's everybody going? And they're like, they're like <laughs> these like, these like five black dudes in the front stayed. And I'm like, how come you're not leaving? They're like basketball team, you know, like they weren't, <laughs> you know, they weren't, they weren't. And, and I said, is this like a religious school? And somebody points and I look above me and there's a cross, like a giant oh, cross Jesus. hanging above me. And I just did a joke about, it was, it was a joke about how AIDS, uh, the Pope, the old Pope said that, uh, condoms didn't help spread the, uh, didn't help spread AIDS or uh, prevent spreading AIDS. And I go, I don't think he really believes that. I think that's just, you know, the, the Catholic party line. I said, I think we should test them and we should kidnap them, put them on TV. If we just like tie them down naked, we take his little Ku Klux Klan outfit off him. We tie him down naked, face down, ass up. And then we bring this guy out from behind a curtain and he's like this gay Haitian IV drug using hooker with full body tattoos and like a pet green African monkey he's got like a magic Johnson jersey on and he's like beer bonging like a pint of cum or something <laughs> and we go this guy is going to fuck you in the ass right now okay but you've got a choice condom or no condom and I go that that's when we will prove right there. And I said, uh, we could even do a commercial. Uh, I forget what the end of the joke was, but I mean, I wasn't even, I wasn't even halfway a, through and you heard crickets. You're like, where did everybody go? They were getting up and walking out. And I was in so much trouble. I mean, my oh. agent called me. What the fuck did you, you're do? like, ah. <laughs> but it was awesome. Um, I did one once where I had a bit about 9-11 and at the end of the joke is like this punchline and I was doing the joke one time at uh, one of these college conferences and they like the sentimental, like the meaning, the message the you know, if you have a deformity or something's wrong with you or you're the victim because that's all who's there and they love it. And so I was doing this bit and it's like I, I, I bait you in with this whole story about why I do comedy. And it's all about, it's a true story about this guy whose wife died during 9-11. And, and I, I went through this, like, I'll do it. For, I hate doing a bit on, but it, I like this because of the story about the bit. Mm -hmm. The story is I went to England because uh, 
I lost my TV show. I had a t- development deal. I lost the deal. I had no money. My my girlfriend left me because she's a whore. And uh, she, it's, and I went to England to do comedy. And this is after 9-11. And, uh, and my life was just falling apart. My first night on stage in Birmingham, England, I bombed so badly they booed me off stage. And I was like, I had a tour set up. And I was like, oh, my God, they're going to send me home. They're going to be like, this guy can't do a tour. He's bombing. So I went back to my hotel room, and I had, like, a mental breakdown. I literally broke down in, like, tears. I'm like, I have no money. I'm in this, like, shithole uh, hotel room in Birmingham, England. I None of my friends. I don't even go. And I picked up this newspaper, and it was an article about 9-11. And I start reading the article, and it talks about how um, – how, uh, this guy, it was people who had lost people in their life in 9-11. This guy's wife was a flight attendant. And he said that the night before she died, they went to a comedy club in New York City, stand-up New York. And he said he was glad he had that last night with her because his last night, like what he remembers is she was laughing so our tears were coming out of her eyes. So I look, I had a Palm Pilot at the time. I look at it and I was like, holy shit, I worked that show the night before 9-11, September 10th. I was like, I was on, I was on that wow. show. And I'm like, wow, this is like a sign from, I don't believe in God, but I was like, this is a sign from the universe or something that like, this is why I do it. It's not about making money or chicks or drugs, you know, whatever. It's all about like making, this is why I do it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right. So I went back the next night and destroyed, I really did. I destroyed on stage the next night and uh, I just changed my attitude and uh, I went back to New York and I looked the guy up because I wanted to let him know out of, uh, out of this terrible tragedy, a little bit of good happened because I'm going to keep doing comedy and keep making people laugh around the world because of what happened. And so I contacted the guy and he agreed to meet me for coffee. And so when I met the guy, as soon as I walked in, the guy pointed at me, he goes, oh, my God, I totally remember you from the show. You're the one guy my wife didn't like. (laughs) (laughs) True story, huh? True. But I got the crowd to build up so hard, like in this, like, oh, my God, this is why he does it. And then I did that punchline and it would work everywhere at the college conference. They booed me off stage after that they were like oh that's terrible and my agent was like you just lost a hundred thousand dollars with that line right there you lost you could have just walked off stage and said this is why i do comedy but you had to do it didn't you and i was like you you have to and i was like i needed the laugh and she's like and i'm sitting there going ah fuck it i don't care about the money it was fucking up so i get another conference like you get like three or four of them that so I go to the next conference and she goes, I swear to God, I will run on stage and tackle you if you do that bit. She's like, don't do, just do your shit, get booked and get your money. And I'm like, okay. So I get on stage, I'm doing the bit. And, uh, every part of me is like, tell the joke, tell the joke, do the punchline, drop that punchline, drop that punchline. But then I just start thinking bills, 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 bills. <laughs> and I fucking don't do it. And I leave to a standing ovation and my agent comes up to me. She's like, I told you, I told you that was great. I go, fuck you. <laughs> like, fuck you. I'm not a comedian anymore. I should quit the business. I sold yeah. out. I fucking hate myself now. And I really did feel like I sold out. And to this day, that money's do gone. Ever, do, you, do you think everybody has to sell out at some point? I mean, this has, I mean, I, I always love Dave Chappelle when they, uh, you know, they, I think he was on Oprah or an interview and they asked him, they were like, you know, they were trying to re-sign Chappelle's show for like, you know, 50 million or something. And he said when they originally did the first couple bits, they would have to like do them in front of the lawyers and all the TV execs and stuff. And like these lawyers were like, you can't do this. Like, and he was <laughs> like, yeah, we're doing this. So then all of a sudden, I think like the the one that he said, like kind of changed his mind was, um, remember when they had like the the Nygar family? Yeah. Remember? <laughs> with, with, with that whole, whole spit? And he said, as they were doing the the bit, like, and and I'm I might be I'm paraphrasing and fucking this up, but like he goes to do the bit, and like the lawyers are like laughing hysterically, and uh, he realized yeah. that like, you know, that the like that like now they were okay, like he had somehow allowed this thing to kind of happen, mm. and they at that point he's like fucking I'm out, and yeah. you know disappeared and went and like you know, turned down all that money. 
and then uh you know like came back and had a really interesting perspective but i like i wonder if like you know he's had to sell out or done that or you know a guy like joe rogan who you know now is uh you know podcast and you know his comedy's so interesting as well but like i wonder if like every one of those guys has a moment where you're like I fucking sold out. I think everybody has to at some point, and we all do things that we don't. Uh, I I heard Clooney say, you know, he used to do the blockbuster films so that he could do the cool films. You yeah. know, like you 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 have. To, we all do it. Everybody does it, and, and and it's like disgusting when you see it. But somebody said once, I forget what musician said. Like when you hear, like when when you hear like a a band's music being played on some commercial. And you're like, oh, like they fucking sold out. He goes, they're not selling out. That's their payment for all the bullshit free gigs they did. Like yeah. coming up, all the hard work, all the shit that you didn't see that they had to do, that all of a sudden they take this and they give you this shit sellout thing and they're they're cashing their check on it. Yeah, and, and you know what? Like uh, um, I always, I mean, that, that's like probably a classic one with like with music and comedy and, all, you know, they've sold out and you're like, everybody has to one feed themselves and like, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of concessions you make for fame. Like uh, that's, that's always an interesting one. I, I, uh, I dated an actress and I remember um, like she went for these parts and like, I was like, Oh, how'd it go? And she's like, Oh, I didn't really want to go meet the director for drinks after. <laughs> and she's like, you know, like the code was like, Hey, let's meet at the Ivy for drinks. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I'm good. And she, you know, there was like, she went through a series of parts that like, she's like, you know, I was like, I had this one and this one and this one and like some major Hollywood stuff. And she's like, so-and-so just went and had drinks. Uh, and I wasn't going to go have drinks at the Ivy, which is code bank for, you know, let this guy bang you. And um, she's like, you know, everybody, she's like, yeah, believe me, you know, Brad Pitt had to go for drinks. Yeah. You know, like yeah. everybody's had to do it. And so well, it's just I, it's you know, a, uh, like, like what you're willing to do for fame. Mariel, Mariel Hemingway, who I'm good friends with, or Bobby, who's on the show all the time, her husband, boyfriend, whatever he is. Uh, I don't know what they call it. Uh, she told me, she's like, yeah, she's like, Harvey would try to get me to come to his room. to, And she's like, I'd be like, fuck off, you know, like just. Well, yeah, but she's also like has uh, like I think what they do in Hollywood is they don't pr like like the people that have, you know, that are with people like, you know, Hemingway is, you know, like I, I forgot she's the daughter of. Uh, granddaughter um, Ernest. yeah or yeah 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 Ernest hemingway so i mean like like there's people that are like within the family and have yeah. family backing whereas i think weinstein was probably just looking for anybody he could to fucking be a disgusting pig with yeah anybody i i've seen those guys and you know, there's another guy i forget his name who uh he's such a creep and he, every hot girl that i knew in new york city he made the movie black and white with ben stiller i forget his name because mm -hmm. they me too him right when he would have been the guy but harvey was worse i even though I think this guy might have been worse. He was just creepier and fatter and grosser. He's a really good director. I wish I could remember his name. But um, Well, I mean, Tom Cruise basically eviscerates uh, Harvey Weinstein and his whole, like, uh, Tropic Thunder deal, <laughs> you know, with the Diet Cokes and all that. Like, it's pretty funny, like, I mean, to, to, to actually be such a degenerate that a dude like Tom Cruise bases an entire character yeah. off of you yeah. who's this, like, legendary fucking asshole, you know? It, I mean, still... I'll tell you that scene actually uh you know i've always liked tom cruise i know he's a little weird but i assume everybody's weird yeah uh he's a little like, weirder than everyone but yeah he's... he might be but i'll tell you he's funny like, as shit though he, dude he's and, and he's he, he can dance he was like totally pitched that whole thing i think the dude's fucking super talented yeah super talented he again another i just reason. don't want to go to, i i just don't want to hang out with him and go to his fucking weirdo church uh jimmy kimmel and adam carolla had the funniest story about him Jimmy Kimmel invited Jimmy used to have football games. At, everybody would go to Jimmy's house to watch football games on Sundays. And uh, I guess on his show, uh, he had Tom Cruise on. He's like, hey, we watch football at my house uh, on Sundays. You want to come over? And 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 uh, Tom Cruise is like, sure. And he's like, he's never going to show up. You know, like this is not fucking happening. And uh, and he goes, uh, he goes, I'll bring my mom. <laughs> They were like, you got to bring your mom. Who brings their mom to watch football? But they were like, all right. And they're like, he came. And he, I think he, I, I could be wrong. I think he brought cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> I think he brought cupcakes. And 
They were all like, yeah, he was cool. You know, he, was, he stayed for a little bit. He watched the game, and then he left. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah, he, he just, I mean, but, but like, you got to think, like, what he's been in, like, I mean, uh, he was in, you know, Risky Business. He was in uh, uh, Red Dawn. I mean, like, all the right moves. I mean, like, all, like I mean, he, from the time he was, like, you know, like, the, yeah. the Outsiders. Yeah. I mean, he was, like... Like, think about, like, all the movies that guy was in. So, I mean, he pretty much grew up in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. That'll make you and, weird. Michael and, Jackson, and like, it makes you weird. Well, but, I mean, he he probably is, like, I haven't gone over and watched football at anybody's house. I mean, what, what do normal people do? <laughs> they probably bring cupcakes. He probably Googled, like, hey, bring cupcakes. Everybody likes cupcakes. I got you know, shows. I, you know? I think it was cupcakes. I'm almost positive it was cupcakes. I, I, like, <laughs> like, I mean, if he showed up with, like, a like a dude with like a keg of beer, you'd be like, oh, fucking Tom Cruise showed up with a keg of beer, but he showed up with probably like $50 a piece cupcakes that some fucking dude handcrafted and bequeathed to him, you know? But they said it was like awkward, you know? It was just like, here's this guy at the house and they're all, you know, talking about gambling, you know, Jimmy's whole crew is all into football and sports and gambling. And then there, here comes Tom Cruise. (laughs) I thought he'd be great. I'd be like, Tom, do you want to sit down? Oh, dude, I, I still laugh. I think it was Adam Carolla uh when they you know they had him up there i love those roasts like oh, yeah. the alec baldwin roasts oh my god dude like i think we need more of those so like do those, i i, dude, I tell comedy people that central are, i tell people that are pc i'm like watch the roasts and oh. watch how people comics of different races dude. talk to each other because we're all friends and dude. because we don't care that we have differences we uh it was the Adam Carolla one where I think the 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 uh, the, the basketball player was like uh, Adam Carolla reminds me of a dude who refers to black athletes as thoroughbreds. <laughs> like there were so many fucking lines dropped and like I mean, dude, they killed killed Alec Baldwin. I mean, uh, like I'm, I mean, I'm, the, I'm, the, the I'm Justin a- Bieber one was epic. I mean, dude, I love those. N- Natasha Leggero trashed Justin Bieber so hard; oh. it's one of the best things ever. Yes. I know. And her husband's a really good friend of mine. And I was asking him, I'm like, please tell me you wrote some of these lines. Cause there's, you know, cause everybody writes yeah. for them. And, uh, sure. com- you'll, if you get a job as a roaster on one of those, you reach out to your like 10 best friends and you go, here's who's on the dais. Write me as many jokes as you can. I'll pay you for the ones I use. And, uh, and then you go out to comedy central and they get you writers too. So then you just compile your best ones and then you have to have reserves because, there's like an order and you want to go early on the list because sure. once your joke gets touched on, it's done. So you have to sure. try to be really unique too. like, say you're roasting Donald Trump. Don't even write a hair joke because that's going to yeah. go right away. Don't, you know, don't write like a McDonald's, you know, like you have to go really, really unique because if it's been touched on, it's not going to get the laugh. But uh, yeah, the roasts are, are so awesome. Just the way watching, Oh, comics not give a fuck. Well, uh, the Justin Bieber one, man, like he was absolutely getting fucking decimated. <laughs> and then and then he gets up there and the kid hold uh, held his own where he's like, hey, look at all you fucking has that are at my roast. <laughs> and he was like absolutely killing him. I was like, good for you. you know, good this I, kid got I, up there. I, I used to trash Bieber. And one night I walk into the Laugh Factory and one of the girls that works there goes, hey, Justin Bieber's in the crowd. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah, he's got a whole crew of friends. And I thought, this kid's a punk. And if he, like, heckles or doesn't, I'm so I start thinking of jokes to, like, roast him before I go on. I'm like, I'll say this, I'll say this, I'll say this. So I'm just, like, kind of putting into my set list if he comes at me. So I go on stage, I do my show, and I can't see where he is, and I didn't realize he was in the balcony. And uh, nothing. And I get off stage, I had a good set, and I walk to the back, and I don't always have a good set. There's a lot of times I suck, but I happen to have a good set that night. And um, I'm standing in the back, and I t- kind of totally forgot about him. And all of a sudden, this kid walks up to me, and I'm talking to the the, uh, the security guy and one of the waitresses, and he goes, um, I'm sorry, uh, I don't want to interrupt. And I'm like, and I realize, holy shit, it's Bieber. And he goes, I go, hey, hey, how are you? And he goes, hey, I... I just want to say thank you. My friends and I, we just came out tonight and we just didn't even know what we were going to do. And we came to the comedy club and he goes, he goes, we had a great time, man. We, you made me laugh so hard. My friends all thought you were great. And I just wanted to thank you. And I was like, Oh, well, 
thank you. And I'm like, I can't not like you. <laughs> I was yeah. like, he was so nice. Uh, dude, I. Uh, he was um, pleasant. He went, excuse yeah, me. I, I don't uh, want to interrupt. I, Dude, like uh, uh, that roast was really smart because it totally like he 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 took it on the chin. He got up there and did it. I, uh, I yeah, I was like, man, I think this Bieber kid's pretty funny. Like he had good delivery. Um, no, but like it, it's pretty funny. Like if I need a good laugh on something, I usually watch one of those roasts. If you're ever and, like, if you're ever in L.A. again, come with me on a Tuesday night. They do roast battle. It it's not well. I mean, when COVID's over, they every Tuesday night is where they do this thing called the roast battle and they have like three events. Like they have the main event and then like the pre fight or whatever it's called. Uh, and it'll be a comic versus a comic. And they're usually <sighs> like no names at the bottom. And as it goes up, they get more. And these, there's a certain group of comics that it's all they do. All they do yeah. is write roast jokes, but there's this thing on the side called the wave. And it's two black guys and a white guy that like come up on stage. They, they did the show on comedy central roast battle. And mm -hmm. but the shit I've seen there is the worst, craziest, most offensive things you've ever <laughs> in. seen in, in your entire in. life. I've taken people there and they're like, holy fuck, I I'm can't like, believe this is going on. Yeah, it's it's Oh, uh, dude, I uh, I uh, there's that um, uh, I forgot the Jimmy guy's name, the English guy. They do like the Jimmy English, Carr, uh, Jimmy, Carr. Yeah, Jimmy Carr, who's got the most annoying fucking laugh on yeah. the planet. Yeah. Like as soon as I hear it, I'm like, this guy's got like, you know, a touch of the downs or something's wrong with him. But uh, I, I was watching their thing in the UK and uh, I was in tears laughing. Yeah. And the funny part is, is that the comics get up there and they're friends. So they have like some yeah. like historical knowledge of each other. Yeah, you pick just, you pick the person you want to roast yeah, against. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're just decimating their friends. And yeah. you know the thing is, nobody gets upset. No, and they're like, oh, yeah, and mm. and and like that's that's what's so interesting. No, but I mean, Where, I'm like, telling. So I work as a judge a lot of times. I'll be a judge on the roast battle, mm -hmm. and um, these comics will like be like, so Sarah's dad died a year ago from suicide, <laughs> and that's probably because. <laughs> She didn't fuck him hard enough. You know, like they, yeah. they say, the, and it'll be like, and I'll be like, did his dad just die? And they're like, yeah. Did his dad commit suicide? And they're like, yeah. Like they, <laughs> they're it's, relentless. It's kind of like, uh, you know, in the NFL, like you get out there and you line up, like um, you're going to take whatever somebody fucking gives you. Like there's no like, oh, that was me. And this guy went too hard. No, or if you line up, you put your helmet on, you get down in your fucking stance, that dude's going to give you fury and hell and like, you know, bring fire and brimstone. So you better be fucking ready. I think the same thing in those comedy things, you go out there and you're like, I'm just got to accept whatever fucking fire gets thrown at me and pretend like it didn't hurt, even when it does hurt. Has the NFL, do you do any of that like CT or uh, uh, the, the testing stuff for CTE? Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, realistically, the only way they say you can test for CT is they got to autopsy the brain. And what they do is they slice it in all these really thin uh, little, you know, almost like on a deli slicer, your mm -hmm. brain. And then they're able to like mix it and they can kind of see the uh, the CTE. I've, I've met some people claim that you can kind of do some CTE testing before. Um, I did the, uh, Dr. Amen had a research deal for the NFL that I was in. And, um, you know, so I went out and I got a fairly decent amount of testing with that stuff. And everything was fine, right? Well, uh, when I retired, the part of my brain that had the most damage was over here on my left frontal lobe from obviously a lot of hits. And uh, so they were pretty uh, like they made a big deal out of that. But then like a couple years later, um, I went to the Newport Research Center, another place, and they did a whole series of scans and found no damage. So that's weird. I really believe the brain can heal itself if you provide it the right opportunities. So it's pretty fascinating um, there's a guy, we're going to have him on the podcast on Power IT Radio. He's got a, his Instagram handle is like Stop Chasing Pain. I think he's a guy named uh, Perry Nicholson. And he's got some really interesting stuff about lymphatic drainage. And what I've always believed, and this is from Dr. Bueller, who's our guy in Caseville, Utah with Amit, um, that the brain uh, gets clogged down because the, the skull gets scarred down and stops moving. So like, you know, when a baby comes out, their skull is kind of flexible sure. where those sutures, you know, end up like they don't actually, you know, even though your skull is hard, it's still supposed to flex and move, yeah. but over time it gets locked down. So Dr. Kurt Bueller does a deal called a cranial manipulation where he puts a balloon in your nose and actually cracks, like inflates the balloon and cracks the sutures. And, uh, I, had, about a year after I retired, I went and saw Dr. Bueller and he did this cranial manipulation and it fucking changed my life. Like really? it was like. 
like imagine if you were wearing like really tight like a like something was kind of like tight around your neck or like tight on your head and like it just was there constantly and you didn't even notice it until you took it off so that was pretty interesting and then i went and did all this myofascial release and had them release mm -hmm. all the fascia in the skull which was really helpful so i think that cranial manipulation all of a sudden once the skull started moving then all of a sudden all the fluid could start moving and it starts kind of clearing it's like uh you know your fucking toilet gets backed up what happens like things can't flush the water sits and I think that that piece of like the, the lymphatic drainage in the, in the skull is a huge factor. And I know that was a big one for me. Cause so I, 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 I have a, I have a couple of buddies that are um, like, uh, you know, action sports guys that have the, you know, the, the falls those guys take, I mean, they don't have the constant hitting that a football player does, but they're when they hit, holy shit. Yeah. And they have yeah. a number of the garbage trucks right outside my bus right now. Um, the, when they hit, their heads just and i've got one buddy who's got like eight concussions that he knows of you know like eight massive concussions he and should he, uh he needs to probably reach out and go see dr bueller or, or some of that stuff i really believe that that cranial manipulation and like being able to clear through that stuff it i mean it was like um when he did it it was like somebody fucking flipped on a light switch it was like a night and day deal and what all sudden, what were you experiencing what were you experiencing before that uh, like, it, um, obviously they said there was damage on the left side. I think, uh, there was some deterioration, but really what it was just like, um, it was like, there was like a pressure on my skull that like, almost like, like a swelling or a pressure that I, that I didn't know existed until they released it. Wow. And then all of a sudden I like, was like, holy shit. Like, I didn't even realize that pressure was going on in my head. And I think what happens with all that scarring and the lack of movement for the skull, I think it just gets... <laughs> And then all of a sudden your, your brain can't heal itself. I, I really believe um, if you provide the right environment, both, you know, training wise and, you know, uh, you know, sleep and all these other key factors, I think you can get your brain to heal. Yeah. I'm going to send that info on to him. Is that a uh, power athlete headquarters right there? Yeah, this is, well, actually this is uh yeah, this is our office. So um, there was a, a horse barn here and I polished the floors. We did that and there's a bunch of, you know, nailed up about 3000 square foot of cedar. So yeah, this is my office. That's awesome. Is that on your property or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything's built on the property here in Austin. So like we got a building with the gym and then the office and everything's encased. Here. Why is everyone moving to Austin? Uh, I don't, well, Joe Rogan. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be cool, like, you know, Joe Rogan moved here. It's yeah. pretty funny. I have a friend who's a realtor and I guess, uh, people have been calling up and just buying homes sight unseen because <laughs> Joe Rogan lives in Austin. It must be a good place. <laughs> So we came here, what, four years ago and um, pretty, pretty uh, random occurrence. But my agent, when I first got in the NFL, was from a little town called Beat Cave, Texas. And I came out here and visited him and I almost bought a place here. And then when we were looking to maybe move, move out of California, uh, we were out here in Austin. And I was like, let me, I said to my wife, let me drive you out to this little town outside Austin that um, I almost moved to. And we came out here and that's where we ended up moving. So it was kind of fortuitous that like 20 years later, it circled back. Do the kids like it? Yeah, they love it. Uh, you know, we live next door to, uh, you know, my neighbor's got like 50 horses. So my little girl rides. Uh, that's awesome. You know, yeah, it's great. Like I, um, it's, uh, I do miss California for a lot of different reasons. I, I miss seeing the beach, I love, you know, my family and, you know, it's where I grew up and it's, uh, you know, familiar in that way. But I, I do like it out here. How far is Rob Wolf from you? Uh, Rob's about an hour south. He's okay. down in uh, in Bernie, New Braunfels area. So okay. I, I tried to get them to move closer, but I think they wanted something a little more rural, yeah. and um, they found a really bitching place there. I got to head out there. I got to go to Waco to go to the uh, right. to the wave pool. Oh, nice! <laughs> that nice. wave pool is ridiculous, and yeah. Oh, yeah. and it's like it's like a hundred bucks to surf it, whereas Kelly Slater's wave is uh, like five thousand dollars. Oh Jesus! So I'm I'm coming to do that one. Yeah, no, uh, 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 the Sornix guys just built, or were here a couple months ago, and built Rogan a gym and all that. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's pretty interesting that uh, um, I was kind of thinking, I mean, Joe probably moved for tax reasons too. I mean, you get paid $100 million yeah. for Spotify. It's probably nicer to have it. So Thir 13, also, 13 million of that would have gone to the state of California. Yeah, exactly. So he's just probably pretty sharp. And then he also realized he could come out here and, 
you know, probably live on the lake and have a bitch in place for, you know, probably a fraction of what he was living at. It was also, they, they, they won't open the comedy clubs and the clubs are open there in Texas. So it's yeah. as a comedian, it's hard to have our, like I'm handcuffed right now that I feel yeah. like I've got all this material. I can't perform. I've been performing like at people's pools and things like that, like outdoor venues. Mm. And it's, it's getting, it's starting to get a little frustrating because it's like, I need to like perform or, it's like you guys need to go find Gavin Newsom and string him up, man. That dude, like, did you see that whole thing where he had like a big party at the French Laundry up in Napa and like, you know, like I, I, I used to party. Such a, he, he's I've such party, a disingenuous piece of shit. I've partied with that guy a few times back yeah. in the day. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, uh, I bet you just looking at him, you're like, this dude's done a bunch of cocaine. He that's just, what like, he looks like. Oh, he totally yeah. looks like that. And uh, I was just, I was, I was on the radio in San Francisco. And um, I'm out one night and my buddy goes, hey, Gavin, this is Eddie, Eddie, Gavin. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, hey, I heard you on the show today. You're funny. And I was like, oh, thanks. Uh, have a drink. Blah, 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 blah. And then after he left, I'm like, who's that guy? And my friend goes, that's the mayor. I go, oh, he knows everyone. He's like, no, he's the mayor of San Francisco. I go. And he was like our age. And I was like, what, this guy, like this young yeah. kid is the fucking bear. And he's like, yeah. Well, it, it helps to have Pelosi be your fucking aunt. Yeah. So then he would come out to my shows and his sister, Hillary, would come out to my shows. And I, I remember right before he became governor, I called him and said, hey, will you do my podcast? And he's like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, does this guy have any idea what my podcast is? <laughs> I'm like, this could be the biggest mistake of his life. But uh, uh, yeah, so... I don't know. Well, I'm glad to see everything's going well down there. Uh, yeah. What's uh, what's going on with Power Athlete right now? Uh, we're just cranking, man. We um, we've just been pushing a ton of programs. You know, thousands of people around the globe uh, doing daily programs. So we have, uh, you know, obviously our landmark programs like Field Strong, Jack Street, uh, you know, Grindstone. We added one for the military and for our, our door kickers with uh, the Hammer program. Um, and dude, we've just been cranking on that. And, you know, uh, I revamped across the football as Johnny Watt, which I think is hilarious. Okay. So that's, I, I sent a buddy to your page. His son is playing football, high school football and I, and he was, oh, has nice. him lifting. And I was like, you got to check out this guy. And I didn't, uh, so I sent him a power athlete, but, um, yeah. but Johnny Watt is the one he wants to do. Yeah, no, I, well, it's just what, what we found is that we had all these different customers and these different archetypes and we just kind of designed uh, programs around what people wanted. And I think like the age old of like, hey, just do the workout of the day is kind of broken a little bit. Yeah. I think people are kind of in this, you know, specificity uh, bucket where like, hey, this is what I'm training for. This is who I am. This is where, you know, this is my use. And I think at that point, you know, kind of deviating from the idea of just fitness and more into performance, which to me is quantifiable. Like if this is what your performance outcome is, this is the program that will allow you to perform at your best. And so I think taking that approach has really been, a, um, you know, just an, an, an excellent way to try to access more people. Uh, have you talked to Ryan Flaherty at all on your show? Ryan Flaherty. He does. Um, he does. He's Nike head of performance training. Uh, no, I haven't. You would love him. He's a really good dude. He's the guy that was doing the, he, he had his own program down in, uh, San Clemente where the athletes would go on or athletes would go before they would go to the combine mm -hmm. and he'd get them prepped for that with their vertical, their, uh, 40 and everything. And he's the guy, the, the whole thing about the trap bar deadlift about oh, yeah. how you need to do that to get your speed up. And, uh, really, really, really smart guy. And it's so funny. I said, one time I was talking to him, I go, who do you, uh, who do you read? Like who are, and he's like, oh, I love buddy Morris. And he's like, he's the strength coach at the Arizona Cardinals, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that was my strength coach at Pitt. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, how funny is that? But he, uh, I've had them both on the show. I've had Ryan on a few times and he's just awesome. You should really get him. Okay. And uh, how was, uh, yeah, no, I, um, I, I know Buddy Morris. So, oh, you do? Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's an interesting guy. He is an interesting guy. Um, yeah. I will, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to, I talk to Ryan every once in a while, so I'll mention, like, yeah. you, you guys would hit it off. Uh, yeah. and, uh, Doug Ostrowski said hi. Oh, Ostraps. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to his sister today. Oh, were you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I don't know if you know, Howard was like announcing if he was going to continue. And then, oh, really? And they just left it like, left it hanging, like without an answer. And I'm like, thought I could get some insight from her and she wouldn't give it to me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, dude, I haven't seen Ostraps in years, but uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm glad he's doing well. Yeah, I'll probably see him next month because he lives right near my in-laws. Oh, he does? Yeah, in, oh, in, that's right. in North Carolina. So, um, oh, shit. Yeah, so I was talking to her and I said, hey, I'm having this guy, John Wellborn, on my show. And I said, he knows your brother. And so she texted her brother while I was talking to her. And she's like, do you know this? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ostraps. Well, that's I'll, hilarious. I'll have to stop and see you guys when I'm in Austin. I'm probably doing a gig Dude. there, gig there probably in uh, February or March. So, shit. Well, hit me up, man. I'd love to come out and cheer for you. Yeah, and I want to see what kind of trucks you got going on now. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right in the middle of some projects, so I uh, I need a little more time to weld, but we'll get it hammered out. I'm driving. I've got a, a Toyota TRD Pro right now. The uh, Ooh, four nice. Yeah, and I still have yet. Well. I did take it uh, up Telluride through the mountain, but I'm going to do an overland next year. Nice. And, uh, but I'm thinking about uh, trading in and getting that new Defender. Oh, yeah. Supposed those, to be, supposed to be like sweet. twice as good off-road. Dude, that, uh, that new Hummer is pretty wild looking too, that electric Hummer. Yeah. Oh. I, I just can't do electric if I'm going like off-road. Yeah. But it's too scary. Yeah, no. It, I forget to charge my though, phone some nights. <laughs> like I can't Dude, imagine. I roll around on like, if I got more than thirty percent, I don't do it. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, hey, thanks for doing the show. They can find you at uh, Power Athlete HQ.com is our URL. Just search Power Athlete. You can find me at John Wellborn. I'm on all the social media stuff. So, Dude, thanks for your time. I appreciate it very much. Always love talking to you. Uh, can't wait to see you next time. And if you're back in LA, give me a call. For sure, man. Thank all you. Right. Hey, See you.